individuals as well as families, churches, and individuals even in the world. It's not just a church only uh, entity that attacks it. But today, we're going to expose it and put it in its proper place. I could tell you in one word, but I want to share something with you real quick. Cell phone calls, text messages, emails, online social networks, chat rooms. There's never been a time when means of communication has been so numerous and easy to come by. Yet, in this world of mass connection, so many people, young and old, feel very lonely. The question is why? The answer is social isolation, void of physical contact and personal in-your-face connection, dehumanizing us as a human race of people, a people of love, of our Father, Abba. How should we react in these times of loneliness? Let's pray. Father, we thank you on this morning. We thank you for your grace and for your love. For you desire for man not to be alone, and yet many have suffered the calamities and the effects of being alone and loneliness. Today, Father, we thank you for our hearing and what you have laid upon my heart to share with thy people, a breakthrough in destroying this thing and exposing it forever, that it will not plague thy people any longer. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for your grace and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how should we react to these times of loneliness? Jesus alluded to this in in the gospel book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. And I'll be referencing uh, King James as well as the Amplified Classic, so you can be able to understand where I'm going with a lot of this. But in Mark 4, 30, it says, And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? Is it like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth? But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs that shoot out, of, that shoot out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under its shadow. When we seek out uh, fellow Christians in times of loneliness, Jesus said that this parable was to explain all through Christianity had a small, although Christianity had a small beginning, it was to grow into a worldwide community of believers, a family. When you feel alone in your stand for Christ, realize that God is building a worldwide kingdom. He has faithful followers in every part of the world, even here in Erie, as well as here at Abundant Life. And your faith, no matter how small you think it may be, can be joint with others to accomplish great things. Look at your neighbor and, and let them know that you're not alone and that we're in this thing together. <laughs> First Kings, and we won't read it, but I'm just as for your reference, but chapter 19, verses 1 to 18, you read about Elijah and how he's seen a lot of his fellow prophets and fellow men in, in the gospel of their time be killed by Jezebel, he then turned around and killed 450 prophets of hers who were evil and up to no good of Baal worshipers. But then we realized something, that Jesus used this parable, although through Christianity, be small and is growing worldwide. Here's the verse, and, and the focus is verse 14. And he said, I have been z- very zealous, this is King James, for the Lord God of hosts, Because the children of Israel has forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I, only am left. They seek my life to take it away. It doesn't sound like a mighty prophet who had just seen, called down the fires from heaven and burnt up not only his altar, but as well as his enemy's altar. And as the Bible goes on, it says that it even licked up the water as they saturated to prove who is God and who isn't. And yet Elijah, after seeing all this and being a part of all this and uttering his words and see the effects of heaven, yet he got scared and he ran. Many of us today, because of fear and because of shame and because of guilt 
and not understanding that the full power of the blood of Jesus Christ releases us from everything that we'll ever say or do, we do the same thing. And in this state, beware of self-pity while you're in this place of loneliness. Elijah thought that he was the only one left who still was true to God, and he had seen the king's courts, the priesthood, become corrupt. After experiencing great victory in Mount Carmel, he had to run for his life. Lonely and discouraged, he forgot that others had remained faithful during the nation's weakness. When you're tempted to think that you're the only one remaining faithful to the task, don't stop to feel sorry for yourself. Self-pity will delude the good that you're doing. Be assured that even if you don't know who they are, others are faithfully obeying God and fulfilling their duties. Another scripture reference in the New Testament is John chapter 16, verses 1 to 16. We're going to focus on verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Jesus filled in the heart of his disciples and his fellow followers, his men that are in ministry with them, knew that his hour was soon to come and that he would be leaving them. And Jesus even felt that, Father, I don't want to leave them. I can see that they're torn. I can see they're going through. I can see that they're hurt. I can see that they're feeling this, this spirit of loneliness and that they don't want to be left alone. And yet Jesus had to die, had to go to fulfill the promises so that he could keep his word and send the comforter. Jesus also uh, referred in the Old Testament, I didn't take time to look it up, but I know it's there, that the temple would be built without man's hand. And we know Solomon, and we know how David desired to do it, but he had bloody hands due to the things that he had got involved with. Then Solomon was given the privilege to build the physical temple of God. But God was like, no, even though I, I understand this, I honor this, I appreciate this, this is a place that I'm going to go until Jesus comes, in which he'll fulfill and make you my temple. That's what God was talking about when he said a temple without man's hand. God created you. Now, I have something that I have to ask you that was asked me, and it threw me for a loop when I, I was asked the question, when did Jesus die? When was Jesus crucified? Before the foundations of the earth. We have this vision, and many of us do because we didn't realize this, that Abba, in his great infinite wisdom, from Alpha to Omega, the beginning and the end, saw things from the end, then he said, let's begin. So when the three were communing together to say, let us do all these things and make man our image, Jesus already was bearing the marks of the cross. He already knew what his part in all of our lives would play. And in heaven, before he came to be born as a man, already bore the marks. So I was thrown when I was asked that question because I'm like, I never really thought about it. And then at that very moment, I thought and I said, hmm, even beforehand, Jesus knew what he had to suffer, go through, and be rejected by his father on that cross, yet he still did it. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you more than you love yourself. And when you can't love yourself, he still loves you. And then to put the icing on the cake, he made provision for everything that you will ever ever face in life, that even in this state of being alone. I mean, if you go back and read Kings about uh, Elisha, it said that the ravens came and fed him. You remember this first stop when he hid under the Jupiter tree? And he prayed, God, kill me. I don't, I'd rather die by your hand than to die by the hand of Jezebel. And yet an angel came and said, eat, be refreshed. He ate and he went to sleep. For the journey was great that he had to take. And then he got up again and went to the cave. And the angel came to him again, awake, eat. And then God told him specifically, I see now it's time for you to come home. But before you come, go and prepare another to take your place. So are we recreating, and I say this loosely, but I think you get the point, Jesus in the earth. Do you know that you are? Do you know that every breath you take, every walk, everything you do, somebody's watching you? They're learning the right way and the wrong way about how and when and where and what to do. And you think that you weren't teaching. Your life is a witness and a testimony of God and what he's doing in our lives as a people. 
And people are watching us to see what God's going to do with this car, this particular congregation, and this prophetic word that we've been given to release into Erie and into our families, into ourselves, into each other. So look at that person that's sitting next to you and said, I told you we was connected. <laughs> Remember, we are never really ever alone because of the Holy Spirit that resides in us, his anointing that is upon us, and Jesus who sits on the throne making inter intercession for us day and night. It never stops. You want to think about something else? Do you know you, you worship a God and you have a Father in heaven that never, ever stops thinking about you, Amen. the individual? Amen. So while you're sitting in that loneliness and while you're going through it, know this. The God who created everything, the God who has no beginning and no end, is thinking about you. Even while we're in our mess, even while we're doing the things we're supposed to be doing, he's still thinking about you. Not only did he think about you, but he made a way for you. No matter how messed up or how jacked up we get, I said it right, jacked up, messed up, you call it whatever you want, he already got a way for you to get out. Even if you're facing death. You know what's the awesome thing? That when you are facing death and you know that you know, that you can't die until it's your time. Amen. So that means that that gun, that bullet, that poison, that bomb, you name it, it goes off, gets ingested, it can't kill you. You got to know that though, see? The enemy thinks that you don't know, so he comes at you with it, and then you look at him, you get to smile. And you wonder why those moderates of long ago and the moderates of today can face death and not have fear, because they know. You remember when Stephen was being stoned and yet heaven opened up so that Stephen could see Jesus standing at the right hand? And he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's able to utter those words because he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, just like we do. And he was able to know this ain't the end. I'm going home. So I don't have to fear death, grave. Jesus overcame all that. There's nothing, no weapon formed against me can prosper. So even in our time of despair, our time of loneliness, our time that we're separated, you're not by yourself. In these last moments to reflect back at, at John 16, his disciples, Jesus said three things within that verse that really stick out. One, he warned them of further persecution. Notice he didn't pray for them to get out of it. Let that sink for a second. Things that we're going through right now, Jesus never prayed for you to get out. He prayed for you to glory in it. He prayed for you to glory while you're going through it so that the world and the devil can see they can't touch this. Even though you may be going through what it is you're going through, Jesus already said you're going to get through it. Follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. So if you walk his path and do what he says, you already won. Even if it looks like you'll never win, you already won. You see, that in itself will give you strength and courage to move on. Number two, he told them when, where, and why he was going. You see, because if he didn't go, none of this would matter. If he didn't die, none of this would matter. If he didn't get up from the grave, none of this would matter. If, he doesn't, if he's not in heaven interceding for us, none of this would ever happen. We would never come together as a church or as a family to worship our God in spirit and in truth and know who we are in him. Isn't that something? To think that you're that important. We are that important. That God gave his only begotten son so that we would not perish and be sent to that lake with Lucifer and his little crew. That was designed for him and him alone. Not one human being. Yet, God, I can't say this enough. I've said it many, many times. He does not want clones and he does not want robots. That's why we are individually, fearfully, and wonderfully, wonderfully made. And I said wonderfully on purpose. Why? Because there's nobody like you. Everybody that acts like you is nothing but a copy. I don't care if they get their nose cut, pierced, hormone, plastic, back, you name whatever. Same clothes, same, can't be you. They can look like you, act like you, sound like you, walk like you, talk, they can do all, still ain't you. Only you can be you. So if we waste our time acting like somebody else, you miss out on what God made you for. And God may have made you for someone to mimic and copy. So that's why if you go back to what I said earlier, you are teaching. You are being an example. You are being a witness just by living your life. Somebody is always watching you. It's not 
Why you fall and how you fail, it's how you get up. You see, he didn't design us to stay down. He knew we were going to fall. So if you get over that part, well, you knew I was going to fall. You didn't get me out of it. Yeah, but now get up in me. Then when you get up in Jesus, you get up in the anointing, you get up in Christ, you get up forgiven, washed, clean. People are looking at you like, how'd you do it? Now you get to tell them. See the difference? The difference is while we're alone, we get into despair. And, and, and I'm going to give you another word in a few minutes here. That it's not, it, it is okay to be, and I'm not going to say it. Gotcha. Number three, assure them that they would not be left alone, but that the Holy Spirit would come. Jesus knew what laid ahead, and he did not want his disciples' faith to be shaken or destroyed. God wants you to know that you're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit to comfort you, to teach you, and to help you. In 3 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, and, and again, we're not going to read them all, but I wanted to focus on 4, 5, and 6, and this is the Amplified Classic writing. I have no greater joy than this than to hear that my spiritual children are living their lives in, in the truth. Beloved, it is a fine and faithful work that you're doing when you give any service to the Christian brethren, and especially when they're strangers. They have testified before the church of your love and your friendship. You will do well to forward them on their journey, and you will you will please do so in a way that's worthy of God's service. So be careful how you entertain strangers, how you treat strangers, even each other. You want to break that cycle of loneliness and alone? Do something for somebody else. And don't do it selfishly so that you get something out of it. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Shake it down. Come on. You know the scripture? Say it louder. And what, what's going to happen when you do that? Oh. So why are you worried about the little bit that you got in your pocket then? You know, a lot of folk get lonely because they think they don't have enough. You remember the Shulamite woman that was, only had a little bit of flour and meal? And she even told Elijah, you know, <laughs> you said, cook you something. I was going to make this last cake for me and my son so we can go die. You know, Elijah said, that's fine, but make me a cake first. Isn't that an odd way of talking to a person who's ready to die? They done told you this is the last of my last, and his answer was, feed me first before you do it. And because she did it, what does the Bible go on to tell us? The oil wouldn't stop pouring until every vessel she had in the house and went and borrowed was full. Do y'all know that full is not to the brim? Full is when it's in overflow. Oh, wait a minute. So you mean, yeah, some of that anointing poured into her house. And it's spread abroad. Uh, that's not a lesson. I'm not going to go there. Wow. <laughs> Got to stay focused. Y'all know me. <laughs> okay. Caring for lonely people can be a cure for loneliness. Let me say it shorter. Caring for the lonely can be a cure for loneliness. Come on. Say, how you figure that, Pastor? Well... In the early church, traveling prophets, evangelists, teachers that were on their way by people who invited them into their homes and fed them. There's a word that we use here even in the church, and it's called hospitality. It's a lost art in many churches today. We would do well to invite more people just for a simple meal. Young people, traveling ministries or missionaries, and those in need, and visitors. It is an active and much appreciated way to show your love. That's one of the things that hurt my wife and I when we, we got laid off and we just couldn't do it anymore. Because we got a kick out of meeting brand new people because we said, what you doing? Nothing. You going to lunch. Come on, let's go. And they look at you like, you invite me? Yeah, come on, let's go. I love doing that. Looking at people's faces and then they get to sit down and then you go, what you going to eat? And then they try and pick the cheapest thing on the menu. They try and, you know, being moderate. And, and I respect that. And I understand that. And I said, no, nah, you know you like that steak. Yeah, well, then get it. And they look at you again, and you'd be like, mm, what? Yeah, eat it. And you want to know something else? <laughs> I had to learn this hard lesson, too. 
And we had went out, and I think it was the pastors, I think it was the pastors we were out with, and I see another pastor and his family sitting there, and I had $50 left in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. Pay for the meal, we gone. And I'm ready to walk out the door, and the Lord said, stop. I said, yeah. He said, give him that $50. Huh? I only got 50 left. Isn't that the lesson I just told y'all? And here I am having this conversation with the Lord. I only got 50 left. What you mean give him 50? I'm going to use this 50 to get some gas and do some other. He said, give him the 50. I took another step. <clears throat> Shook his hand, slid it to him. He said, you don't have to do that. I said, I know. Trust me, I wasn't going to, but the Lord said, do it. <laughs> Just like y'all laughing, he started laughing. He stood up and gave me a hug, and I said, enjoy yourself. You don't owe me nothing. Don't you ever tell nobody. That's why I'm not telling y'all his name. Don't you ever tell nobody. Little did I know, he wanted to be able to eat a certain meal, and he just didn't have enough with him. Now he's able to enjoy his meal, enjoy his family, enjoy his company, all because I moved in obedience. Also, little did I know that when I got home, there was a check in the mailbox from a customer who owed me money from years ago, and all of a sudden, he paid me. The Lord knew it was there, but I didn't, so I had to trust the Lord. And then when I got home, this, this was Sunday, so that Monday, when the mail came, I'm like, well, I, you was testing me, wasn't you? I, I share that story with you simply because of this. Many think that just because I don't have the stake and I don't have all this other stuff that I can't share. and I can't. Who told you that? Because if you bring your green beans and you bring your corn, you bring your carrots, I bring hot dogs, you bring hamburgers, it's called a picnic. Hello? Y'all ever know every time we do something here in the church, and we, we call it potluck, but and forget the luck. It's just the, us coming together as one pot, one stew coming together, and it tastes real good, don't it? <laughs> See if we just get rid of these ism and schisms. <laughs> I'm a prostitute. I messed up. Mm -hmm. Did y'all know that a prostitute was in the lineage of Jesus Christ? Amen. Her name was Rahab. Right. right in the middle of her doing her thing, right in the city, when the soldiers or when the spies came in and she said, those be holy men. I want to ask y'all something. Who told her those were spies? Amen. Did you ever think about that? Hmm? You ever wonder who touched her heart to say, those are spies, take them in and hide them? And she said, come with me. And she hid them, and they said, hang a red scarlet in your window, so when we come to destroy the city, we'll spare your household. Do you know what they was really saying? Because you did this kind act, and you help us to fulfill the plan of God, we're going to make sure that you're in the plan of God. So she's the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. So who told you you weren't worthy? Mm. Who told you because of the things you got yourself into that, this, that disqualifies you? Who told you that lie? Do you know the Alpha and Omega? God already knew. So he already done seen the mess up, cleaned it up, and you're in glory, but you're in this moment, what we call time, that we're in this place where we're at right now that we can't see the end, but God's already at the end with open arms saying, come on home, baby, when it's time. But until then, be busy about my business. Simple, isn't it? But do you know loneliness is what cuts you off from knowing that? Because you get in this self-pity thing. Woe is me. Why am I by myself? Well, that's another part of the lesson, but um, you know what? I, I got to go there. Because of our individualistic, self-centered society, there are many lonely people who wonder if anyone cares if they live or die. If you find such a lonely person, show him or her that you care. Sometimes it's just a gentle hug, a handshake, a smile. I remember uh, listening to uh, Victoria Osteen. She was uh, in a mall just walking by, and this girl walked by her, and she just said, had a, a, just a prompt, you know, down inside and said, just tell her she's beautiful. And Victoria, not thinking about anything, walked over and gave her a hug and said, you know, you're very beautiful. And this woman was all toe up from the flow up. But little did she know this girl was getting ready to go commit suicide. And she told her she was beautiful. This young lady got so inspired, not only did that spirit get off of her, but then she went and got cleaned up, and then weeks later came to the church and told her, I'm so glad that you said that to me because I was feeling bad 
didn't think nobody loved me nor want me, homeless, just, just tore up, and then you said that, and that, that just let me know who I am. Look at, your, look at the person sitting next to you and say, you lovely. <laughs> say, you beautiful <laughs> with your fine self. <laughs> Here's something that I want you all to realize. Did you hear the joyous laughter that got lifted up in this room just now? All because you said those words. Even if you said it jokingly, even if you said it and you were shy, you, see, people still smiling. Look, 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 look across the room, see? Power in your voice, power in the words, power in knowing that the Holy Spirit that is in you wants to reach this dying, lost world. That a kind smile, words, just words that you mean from your heart, and you freely obey what the Holy Spirit is telling us will set other people free from their bondage. Amen? Loneliness is not the same as solitude. I'll say that again. Loneliness is not the same as solitude. There are many different, different uh, definitions in different uh, uh, dictionaries, but loneliness more often suggests isolation accompanied by a longing for company. You know you never know you're alone until you want somebody to come by you other than yourself? Solitude can refer to a situation of one who by wish or makes plans for cuts off from normal contacts. So solitude can be desirable under certain circumstances, such as prayer time and meditation. Jesus in Matthew 14, verse 13, and in Luke uh, chapter 4, verse 42 in the Amplified. Where, and I'll read that one for you. Um, when daybreak came, and he left Peter's house and went into an isolated desert place, and the people looked for him until they came to him and tried to prevent him from leaving them. And as many of you have studied the, the gospel and the four writings, you understand there was many times that Jesus would stay up all night. Why? Because he didn't want nobody around Why? he was talking with daddy. Come on, it was his one-on-one -on -one time with his father. Not because he was alone, but because he wanted to spend that one on time, one on one with him, his spiritual father. So why don't we do it? I'm not saying that we're not, but why don't we do that? When you have that time where you feel like you're alone, it, turn it into a solitude time, an isolation time. Ah, but this must mean this was a time for me to talk with you and watch him come in. One of the things I used to do back younger when I first got in ministry, and I had the keys to the church, I would come here with the church totally empty, and I would just sit here on the steps, and I would just have a nice little talk with Daddy. Not that I couldn't do it at home or do it in my car, you know, and do it in my prayer closet. No, it was just something about coming to this church and sitting in here when there's nobody here to disturb, with the lights off even, and there's nothing but natural light coming through the windows, and then just talking with Abba. And it's in those solitude times, those quiet times, that he downloads everything that I need, especially for today. And going through the praise and worship that we did today and the warfare that we did today, I'm like, hmm, that opened the way for destroying the spirit of loneliness. Also in Luke, and we won't turn there, but in chapter um, 5, verse 16, chapter 6, and verse 12, for those that like to study. Uh, loneliness, on the other hand, is a very painful feeling. What can cause these feelings? Lonely hours of the night, you wrestle with God with your feelings. Mm -hmm. When you feel desperately alone, rejected, perhaps your best friend deserted you. The one who you hoped to marry, married another. The one you did marry, wants another. So separation and divorce, unwanted singleness. A child turned his back on you, mom, dad, or the parents did the same to the children. Old, young, inexperienced. Some of us um, older children in here went through that. You ain't old enough. Get out. But, 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 sit down, shut up. Like, wow. All because I was young, I wanted to learn, so I wouldn't be young and inexperienced. That led into shyness, shame. And this list can go on and on and on, and we don't have enough time. Ironically, you can feel 
equally alone on a crowded street? How about a train terminal, airplane, airport? How about in the middle of the crowd right here in church? Some feel alone right now. You're sitting right here amongst all of us, and yet you feel alone because of shame, shyness, because of hurt, guilt, I'm different. Think about it. Ask yourself this question. Here you're in the physical presence of people, and yet you have that feeling. That is not normal. I'm not saying emotional. I'm not saying crazy. It's a spirit that's trying to isolate you from knowing that you're loved and you're accepted and you belong to a family. Not just your natural family, but your spiritual family. God the Father desired not to have us just in his thoughts and in the very beginning of creation, but created a body so he could have a human family, so he gets the best of both worlds. You didn't think he was all that, and yet you was in God's mind before he said, let it begin. You see, when you uncover all the lies and get rid of all that, you realize just how important, how precious you really are. So why does God allow us to get lonely? That's a, that's a, you know, a good question. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord himself said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a companion who will help him. God did not intend for us to be lonely. Quite the contrary. God said, be fruitful and multiply. So does that sound like he wants you to be by yourself? No. He wants a multiple, a multitude, multiple family. Now, they estimate there's right around 8 billion people on the earth right now. I, I beg to differ. See, if you count from Adam until this time of 8 billions, there's trillions of people that lived upon this earth, just not all at the same time. Think about it. And babies being born today and in the future, there's more than that. So, Abraham, your children would be like the stars. Can you imagine when he looked into the sky and looked at them stars and said, wow, I'm going to have that many kids? Whew. Wow, God. And this galaxy still being explored, still being um, um, uh, revealed, because they have the technology now to go even deeper in space. And yet his family is bigger than that. So how many people live upon this earth? Oh, see? When you start looking at things a little bit different, you start realizing you're not the only one. Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am convinced that nothing, this is very important scripture if I can say this before I read it, very, very important that you got to know that you know that you know. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate me from his love. Death can't, life can't, angels can't, demons can't, fears for today, worries for tomorrow, even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away from you. Get that grounded down and make it part of you because that is who you are. No matter how high the skies is, how deep the oceans are, is, nothing in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ. Jesus our Lord. God never intended for us to be alone. He has promised us that he will always be there. Nothing can separate us from him. He intended for us to have a human as well as a spiritual relationship with him. Finally, last question for you. I'm alone. What can I do? How can God help me with my loneliness? First of all, stop claiming loneliness belongs to you, because it don't. The reason it can set up a stronghold in our lives and it can attack us and come to us is the fact we keep ownership of it. Release ownership. Sell it back to the devil. I said it right. Sell it back to the devil. You know how you sell it back to him? Get out. It's that simple. You got to go. Matter of fact, Holy Spirit, come in. Y'all know... Um, I'm trying to think of the scientific thing about mass not being able to exist in the same place. Uh, Y'all get what I'm talking about. So either Jesus is in the house or the devil's in the house. They both can't live in the same house. So it's up to you to invite who you want in your house. Is it that simple? That's so. 
Let me give you a series of scriptures. Do not try and copy them all. I mean, if you want to copy them, I will make a copy available. There's a whole bunch of them. I'm going to just highlight just a few of them just to encourage you and to let you know what God's word has to say about you. In Psalms 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of death, you're close to me. And not just close, he's now in you. So now when you walk through that valley of death, God is in you, his anointing is upon you, and he walks with you. And not only that, he has angels assigned to you. Not only that, there's somebody on the other side of the world that's got you on their heart that's praying for you. And while they're praying for you, somebody's praying for them. So don't take it for granted that when you're in a solitude time and somebody's name or somebody's face pops, pray for them. And you'll find out that when you come in contact with them, and if you come in contact with them, all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, how did you know that I was Abba? He knew I couldn't pray for myself, so he had somebody else in the earth pray for me and with me. Get it? Where two shall touch and agree, let everything be established. So when you're praying, somebody else is praying, that's the two. Wait a minute, it gets better than that. Then you got me, myself, and I. When you're praying with yourself, come on, not praying to yourself, with yourself. Lord, I agree. You know, when you say that, your spirit says it, and then your body says it, then your soul says it, your emotions says it, your thoughts says it. So when all of them saying the same thing, come into one accord, bingo, you thought you was by yourself. <laughs> Isaiah 54.10, the mountains may depart, the hills disappear, but even then... I will remain loyal to you. This is God's promise to us. Recognize that you are not unlovable or deficient just because you're, you are alone. You have value because God made you, loves you, and promised never to leave you. Exodus chapter 5, verses 20 to 23. Moses, feeling a little despair, <laughs> said to God, why did you send me? Because the people was, they was bucking up against him. And he started feeling it. And he's like, God, why are you send me? Wait a minute. Isn't that somehow some of you feel when God sends you to say something to somebody or talk to somebody and then they put a stone wall up to you and you'd be like, Pfft. Jesus said that they rejected me before they rejected you. Why did you think it'd be any different? Remember a few minutes ago when I said that you would go through persecution? He didn't pray it away. He prayed that you would go through it. Not stay in it, but go through it. And in going through it, you're going to gain a whole lot more people who's falling behind you. First Kings 19.4, he sat under the Jupiter tree and prayed that he might die because he was in this place. We're talking about Elijah. In that same chapter, in verse 10, I alone am left, and now they're trying to kill me too. That's a, what travels with loneliness, by the way, is a spirit called despair. And despair will deceive you and cloud you so that you can't see your mission or who you purposely are. What about in Matthew um, chapter 11, verses 2 and 3? John the Baptist, who's now in prison facing death, sent his disciples to Jesus and said, Are you really the Messiah we've been waiting for? Should we look for another? Come on, this is John the Baptist who, when he was a baby inside the womb of Elizabeth, who came in contact with Mary and Jesus was riding there, and it says that John jumped when he came into the presence. Now he's questioning. Yeah, but what did Jesus say to his disciples, to John's disciples when they came and they sent that question to him? Jesus said, go back and tell him about the miracles. Tell him the things that you see and hear me doing. Tell him all these things. You know, the Bible doesn't say what happened, but you know what happened. The disciples went back and told John, and John knew that he knew that he knew that he did meet the Messiah, and the Messiah is here. Now he can face that king, and as you know, they cut off his head and served it on a platter. Why? Because death had no power over him then. He wasn't under despair anymore. Him being alone in that prison, he realized he's not alone. He had a purpose and a reason for being born. There would be none greater than John the Baptist, and yet even he had to deal with that spirit. How about this? 1 Peter 
4.19. If you're suffering according to God's will, keep on doing what's right and trust yourself to God who made you, for he will never fail you. Sometimes we feel alone in our stand for Christ. We can take comfort in knowing that there are others who are equally committed and that God rewards our bold commitment. That's a mission statement in itself when he said to go forth, go into the world preaching and teaching. As I said, I'm not going to read all these. Finally, this last thing about loneliness, and then we'll be, we'll be finished with this. I feel like everyone has deserted me. We all have felt that at one time or another, where your closest friend, your boo, your beau, your husband, wife, children, you know, your boy, your girl, you, you call it whatever you want, and then when you need them, they weren't there. When you needed them most, they weren't there. When you was getting beat up, they weren't there. When you was feeling lonely, they weren't there. And yet, Exodus 6.12, Moses objected, my own people won't listen to me anymore. In Psalms 27.10, even my mother and my father abandoned me, but the Lord will take me up. The Lord will hold on to me. Proverbs 18.24, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend will stick closer than a brother. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid of them. For the Lord your God will go ahead of you, and he will neither fail you nor forsake you. I don't know which promise that you're waiting on, but that was a good one. To know that God has already went ahead of you. All the way to if, if you went in ever it's time to go to the grave or we be raptured and never see the physical grave. You're still going to die in a blink and twinkle of an eye and being caught up and take off. Check out Thessalonians. It'll tell you the rest of the story. The eternal God of our refuge and everlasting arms thrust out the enemies from before you. Oh, that reference is Deuteronomy 30, or 33, 27. Finally, Hebrews 13, 5. God said, I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. People we depend on sometimes deserts us, abandons us, turns away from us. There are many, be only a few people we can truly count on at times there may be not any, but one we can always count on, Abba Father, Jesus the Christ, sweet Holy Spirit. They or he will never, ever abandon you. Amen? Come on to your feet. I know it was a lot of dialogue, a lot of reading, but I hope that this entire day has encouraged you and put you in a place where now you have some weapons. And again, if you would like the list of these scriptures for your personal uh, time and solitude and meditation and prayer, just let me know who you are and then I'll, I'll get copies made and you can have these scriptures. These, that's, these are just a foundational part of the scriptures to kind of give you an idea and let you know that it's not just an idea, it's a personal relationship with Jesus. Many of us think that our, our relationship with Jesus got severed because of things that we may have got caught up in or we may have done wrong or we may be even in right now. But the Lord says, I've already reconciled you to myself. Before you were born, I knew these things were going to happen. You didn't catch me off guard. You got caught off guard because you're living in this time, in this scheme of beginning and end that I know, but you don't. So who better to go to in prayer? when you're going through or need encouragement or need to be set free. Amen. So let's go there. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name, Lord. We give you all praise, honor, and glory, Father, that we thank you that in this time, Lord, where we felt alone, we felt in despair, uh, we felt that we've been pushed aside and disregarded, Lord, that even in that place, Father, you're there. If we descend and into the depths of hell, yet you're there. If we could and was able to rise above heaven and go beyond where heaven is, Father, you're there also. There is no place that we can go or ever think to go that you're not already there. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that it's through your mercy and through your grace and through the oracles of time that you have sent Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, that he suffered all these things 
and bore them on the cross to take full rejection from what sin is in your presence and then to turn to man and be rejected of man to be sent into a hell, into a prison. The devil thought that he had triumphed, but he actually was part of the plan for Jesus couldn't have did it unless he died. And because he died and went into the grave and rose again and is now seated at your right hand, making intercession for us both day and night, ne continuous, never stopping. We thank you, Father, as we have come into this place of humility, this place of, Lord, thank you. We can't say it enough, Father. Thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me. Even in the state that I'm in, you came and you washed me clean. You made me whole. You restored me. And I thank you, Father, for this family which you have implanted me in, this kingdom which you have raised up amongst people, that we together as the body of Christ, Lord, will send out your message of love and redemption to the people of this world, Lord, and even to those who are here that may be in despair or going through, that we not give up hope, but that, Father, you love us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. We don't take uh, for granted that everyone here has a relationship with Jesus, even though I know many have visited and have come many, many times. Yet I've heard stories of, of deacons that came up and said, I want to get saved. They served in the office, was doing everything a deacon does, but wasn't saved. And come to himself and say, hey, you know what? Forget about this. I want to make sure my soul is going where it needs to go. Everybody's going to heaven. The question is, are you staying? And what I mean by that is, are you staying in God's family or are you descending with the devil to go to the lake of fire? That's the message that was preached in, in churches years ago. And it needs to come back now. Because there are many people who are dying, who are sick, who are hurting, that don't have to. All because we remain silent. When we won't speak, that's when evil prevails. But when we speak, even when you think you're not being, uh, let's just say, uh, 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 winning or, or you're not getting through, yet you are because you're planting seeds. You see, as we plant seeds, water it, God gives the increase. If there's any amongst us that's in a place of, of let's just say, brokenness, let's say in a place of need, that you're battling this thing about being alone, and dealing with loneliness, and you don't want to deal with it any longer, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Take a bold step of faith and step out of your seat and come on up so that we can pray with you and break that thing.